My God, was this a difficult list to make. The golden age of television, indeed. So I sat down to make this list of my top 10 shows of 2020, and I ended up with a list of 22 shows. Oh, news! So I had to whittle it down to 10. I had to cut 12 great shows. It was so hard to do. So good luck making your own lists, which I can't wait to see down below. Uh, okay, number 10, Dirty John, the Betty Broderick story. I know, I know. I'm sure some of you are like, how did that make your top 10, Grace? But what a show. If you haven't watched this show, you are missing out. Betty Broderick murdered her husband and his new wife. Not a secret, it's at the beginning of the show. But the devastating divorce case that drove her to madness and is chronicled throughout the series was a turning point in real life. This is, you know, it's based on a real story and recognizing that housewives do contribute to their husband's success. Betty Broderick was at the transition period of how housewives were viewed in the 1960s and how they were viewed, how they're viewed today. It's really interesting to see her gaslighted by her husband and tossed aside for a new model. Her speech about everybody wants a kitten, but nobody wants a cat is so moving and how it's hard for anyone to believe or respect a woman in the circumstances that she's in. My God, it's good stuff. I can't believe they got Christian Slater to do this show, but he nails it. It's not a paycheck gig. He's in it. He's in it to win it. And I'm so happy to see Legion's Rachel Keller getting more work. She's also very good. But this is a tour de force for Amanda Peet. I never got Amanda Peet. I was like, why is David Benioff keep telling everyone he's married to Amanda Peet whenever he accepts an award? I thought he was just bragging. But no, he's trying to get Amanda Peet more work because she deserves it. She's really talented. She's got skills. I am a huge Amanda Peet fan now. She is so good on this show. It's a very brave performance. She does such a good job. All right, I'm, I'm gonna go around promoting Amanda Peet too. All right, number nine, Love, Victor. I really enjoyed the movie Love, Simon, on which this is spun out of. It, you know, it focuses on a, a new LGBT student. But the original movie from Greg Berlanti, uh, who didn't stick with the material, but he got it off to a good start because, you know, that I reviewed that film. I wish it had done better. I think they showed it to too many people for free, as we discussed, to try and get buzz going. But it was a really well-done high school romantic comedy that is, just happens to be about an LGBT teenager. And here again, as I said, we follow a new student, but also Simon comes back. Uh, he's uh, Nick Robinson's a producer on, on this show. And that really emphasizes the, uh, that the LGBT community is a family that's there for you when sometimes your own family sadly is not. That was very powerful. Uh, and on that note, the show's ending for season one, what a cliffhanger. I'm so glad it's coming back for season two. The whole cast is fantastic, and the show has a lot of heart. It feels very authentic. It's not after school especially at all, especially at all, which I think is great. So often, LGBT roles in Hollywood have been supporting quirky comedic relief. So in 2020, it was so great to finally see legit LGBT leading roles emerge. And on that note, let's go to number eight, Harley Quinn season two. Now at the end of season one, I didn't know how the show would get Harley and Ivy together as a couple. And I know some of you are very upset about what happened to Kite Man, but I think Kite Man preserved his dignity. He stood up for himself. And you know, that was very realistic. That stuff happens. Ivy admitted that by hiding from her true self, which was pretty clear to all of us when we saw how she interacted with Catwoman, she hurt other people and she owned up to that. I'm sure that she will make, make, it, up, make it up to Kite Man. Kite Man's a great guy. I'm sure he'll find someone else. He's a great guy. Harley and Ivy ended up feeling like a real love story. In season one, and it's so nice to see DC really finally acknowledge that since they've been kind of trying to hide it ever since the two characters were introduced in the animated series, as you know. Even Paul Dini has said he always, who created, Har created Harley Quinn, has said he always envisioned them being romantically involved, but just couldn't do it because, you know, he was doing something that was supposed to be all ages entertainment. Which, you know, at the time, you couldn't do that. You could totally do that today. Anyway, in season one, we got, I think, the best exp exploration yet of why Harley felt she needed to leave Joker. That was phenomenal. And then in season two, we saw how she fell in love with her best friend. It was beautiful. The ending, oh my God, the Thelma and Louise style ending. It was so good. I mean, and the callback to the car where they were first. I mean, that's amazing when they first met. 
That's just so great. And then besides their relationship, Harley Quinn is just a hilarious show that gets DC and DC fans, period. It's the adult version, in my opinion, of Batman the Animated Series, and it is absolutely fabulous. I cannot wait for season three. It's going to be so good. All right, now, and by the way, they said in season three that they're going to not try and like have any drama between Harley and Ivy. They're just going to be a couple, and they're going to deal with stuff, and there's going to be more of a focus on Ivy because season one and season two were so Harley-centric. It's going to be good. All right, so number seven, Umbrella Academy. You know, I know this is Netflix's whole thing about dropping a whole season at once, but I think for Umbrella Academy, they might want to switch to the weekly release model because, well, we're going to get to the boys, but now I really do think that Umbrella Academy faded away from conversation just way too quickly, and that's why it's number seven on my list. I also felt the ending was a bit sloppy, and I don't know how I feel about Lila's power set, even though she is one of my favorite characters on the show now. Love her. But a lot of great female actresses were uh, recognized this year, which is so great. TV has been long said to be a real place for women to get attention in great roles, where maybe in other mediums they don't. And boy, can you see that in this list. All right, so anyway. But the character development this season was so good. 10 one-hour episodes, and the Umbrella Academy didn't waste a single minute of it. Not a single second. The callbacks, the way everything connects, and the history angle taking place in the 1960s was used really well. The show is a ton of fun. It's so funny with a stellar cast. Everyone has their favorites, although it's getting harder to have favorites because everyone's so good. They even made Diego a, fan a fantastic character. And the budget for some movie-level VFX sequences. Ah, oh, that opening, I think none of us will ever forget how good that opening was for season uh, two. As TV gets more competitive, I am very excited to see how the Umbrella Academy ups its game, which it will need to do for season three. All right, number six, The Great. Just like Betty Broderick made me a fan of Amanda Peet, I now get Elle Fanning. She's so good here. So is Nicholas Holt. This is a very female-centric show, but it's admirable that they took the time to really develop Holt's character as well. Is he a villain? Is he just misguided? Is he a victim of the times and what it means to be a royal? It's hard to tell, and that's what makes it really interesting. Uh, it's, this is where touche comes from <laughs> instead of touche and huzzah. It's a great show. I'm also a fan of history, and I very much enjoy this show, not just for its gender politics. I know you might be like, ugh, gender politics. Watch it, trust me. But exploration of the realities of royalty back when they really were in charge. Not a great system, as you can see. What a quirky, delightful surprise. And it's a gorgeous show, too. I didn't quite care for The Favorite, which is from the same guy. I know a lot of people did. I thought it was okay. Well, this is so good. I love it. I'm very curious to see where things go in season two, considering the end of season one. Ah, oh, get on this. It's amazing. All right, number five. Hulu's got a lot of representation on this list. Good for you, Hulu. I think I have almost every streaming service here. All right, number five, Raised by Wolves. Who would think a show about religion creating a futuristic version of the Bible? As I said, it's like the Bible, but with the devil and God switched, like the devil is in charge. Who would think that would be so thrilling? You're like, are you ready for a class on religious like theology? And you'd be like, no. And then you see this and you're like, oh my God, it's so good. It made me really interested in that. Of course, it doesn't hurt that the show is clearly built on Ridley Scott's love of androids, even though the show isn't officially a part of any of the, either of those franchises. And while Scott has delivered some amazing android characters over the years, mother and father, oh, I love them, are in a class by themselves, even more interesting than David, although I would love for them to meet David, uh, which is one of the versions of David. This show is both futuristic and medieval, a really tricky mashup that Aaron Guzikowski pulls off in spades. I mean, he makes it seem effortless. It's like the the research on this show must be nuts. The show has the show has this show has been renewed as well. But here's hoping HBO Max, which has struggled out of the gate, doesn't cut their budget too much, which I've heard that they're trying to do. Because this is one of the TV shows this year that definitely felt like a 10-hour movie. Oh, I loved it so much. What a show. Number four, The Boys. While the story was a bit weaker in season two, to me, The Boys really excelled this year for two, pl for two reasons. One, continuing to show Homelander and Butcher's two different sides of the same coin. I love that. And also, getting us used to a weekly release schedule rather than dropping an entire season all at once. It was painful. I hated it. We all complained. But in hindsight, it was the right thing to do. Trial, you know, Bert, 
Born in fire, baby. That's totally what happened this season. But it was right. I, I'm going to review the show by episode weekly next time. And that it really was the right thing to do. The Boys has made Anthony Starr a comic book genre superstar. Rightfully so. He is so good. Jack Quaid, for some reason, is getting most of the work off of The Boys. I mean, he's really good too. But Starr should get more work. He's so great. He's like Hans Gruber level as a villain. Season two felt a bit like a transition season, right? So I hope that the next story arc in season three really delivers after this setup. Plus, season two ultimately did deliver with an amazing, unforgettable season finale with so many great moments and visuals. Wow. Number three, The Queen's Gambit. Add Anya Taylor-Joy to my list of new favorite actresses. Uh, also, I'd like to put Mariel Heller, you know, I don't know if she's on, you know, you know what, let's add her. I loved Mariel Heller. She was so good. She's a director, and boy can she act as Beth's adopted mother. She really made an impression on me. Screenwriter Scott Frank levels up to director here, uh, usually works with Steven Soderbergh and James Mangold, and you can see those influences in his work. With a show that has been in Netflix's top 10 to this day since it debuted in October. That's amazing. That's a phenomenon. The Queen's Gambit is as stylish as it is smart. What fashions? What eyeliner? And pulls off a really neat trick and that it's a really strong feminist show that didn't offend anybody and that everybody loved. I thought that was really neat and that was great. Uh, and also, you know, it does show that, you know, anybody can tell a great story about uh, anybody. You know, you just have to have the inspiration. It was great stuff. We're getting down to it now. Number two. Ted Lasso. Number two. If you've seen Ted Lasso, you totally get why it's number two. If you haven't seen Ted Lasso, I feel sorry for you. Apple TV sure needed a hit, and here it is. It's their only hit. Spun out of a series of sports promos for NBC, Ted Lasso, out of the gate, is one of the best pieces of entertainment I've ever seen, period. You can't, I can't even explain to you how good it is. It has to be seen to be believed. You're going to be like, no way it's that good. And you're going to turn it on and be like, where's this show been all my life? It's so popular that Apple TV has already renewed it for two more seasons. Oh my God, I hope they make them back to back. And suddenly, finally, Jason Sudeikis is on the verge of superstardom with this character. Now, whenever I see Jason Sudeikis and he's not Ted Lasso, I'm a little disappointed. I'm like, oh, where's the mustache? Where are the fun quips? Where are the anecdotes? And on that note, this show is a, it really excels in its writing. I mean, it's got twists and turns, but also really funny stories and wordplay from the lead characters. That's got to be so hard to come up with. It might be a combination of improv and the writing team, but boy, is it really, it just blows your mind. The show is also sweet, funny, and smart, and a show where the good guys finish first, which is a joy to watch. I love everybody on this show, but I think one of the big shout outs uh, also is Hannah Waddingham, who was on Game of Thrones as that character, is the shame character. Can you believe that? She's so good here, but everyone's good. I love everybody on the show. There's not a weak link in the cast. Then finally, there is no question that the number one show of 2020 is The Mandalorian. Despite an odd veil of secrecy over the second season, and that's all we're gonna say about that for now, because we're gonna celebrate The Mandalorian. There is a lot to celebrate. This is the show that not only saved Star Wars, but is setting up its future, as well as Disney's first very successful test case, ridiculously successful, of expanding a film franchise to its streaming service. Marvel is next with WandaVision. Every Friday, I mean, Disney Plus is on, the tra is on track to just own Fridays till the end of time. That's amazing. I mean, I don't know what's gonna happen when movies start coming out really big. Maybe they'll switch their release date, although it was fine for the first season of The Mandalorian. But these, ep these episodes are getting bigger and bigger. Every Friday, Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni surprised audiences and critics, because this is a show that they don't even release in advance to critics, with a new chapter, creating a show that felt and was received very much like big screen entertainment. And every week there was an exciting new guest star, sometimes more than one, that set audiences abuzz. And just when we thought nothing could be better than Grogu, who got a name this season, and some cute little yoga poses and, and cookies, it was fantastic. This show on the memes alone is so fantastic. But we got live action Ahsoka, Rosario Dawson, uh, she's, she's had fans for a while, but she's really leveled up. As I said, this is like Wonder Woman level good in terms of casting with a female action hero. I'm so excited. She's getting her own series. Can't wait. This is the way for Disney+. Plus, and, it's, and other studios are hoping it'll be the way for them with their franchises and streaming services, as HBO Max and I'm sure other places are getting set to copy the same formula. 
So these are my top 10 shows of 2020. Share your own lists and thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.